This is your news tonight. Here are your top stories. Russian forces siege the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, which is set ablaze during the fight. Ukraine says the fire is now extinguished. Ukrainian cities desperately hold on under bombardment to the north, east and south, but Mariupol and Kyiv warn they are now encircled. With more death, more suffering and more destruction. The NATO chief warns that the days ahead will only get more difficult as he holds talks with the US Secretary of State and EU foreign ministers meet in Brussels. Thousands more Ukrainians take to the road if they can in a desperate bid to get out. Neighboring countries ramp up their efforts to help as millions more are expected. The Kremlin continues its crackdown on critical reporting. Independent TV station Rain delivers a final broadcast as a law is passed imprisoning those who spread so-called fake news. I'm Helena Humphrey. It is good to have you with us. Well, it's been a busy day of meetings and diplomacy in Brussels. NATO says it will not implement a no-fly zone over Ukraine, despite calls from Kyiv for stronger assistance. At a foreign minister's meeting, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg warned that the worst is yet to come as Russian forces continue their advance. The NATO chief called for President Putin to withdraw his troops and engage in diplomacy, but once again stopped short of offering military support. On a no-fly zone, uh, it was mentioned uh, uh, at the same time uh, allies agree that uh, we should not have uh, NATO planes operating over Ukrainian airspace or NATO troops on uh, uh, Ukrainian territory. Well, in Brussels for us, our correspondent Maeve McMahon. Maeve, good to see you. We've just seen that press conference between US Secretary of State Antony Blinken and EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. What were their key takeaways? Good evening, Helena. Well, we just saw Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission President, speaking alongside uh, Anthony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, putting off a very united, determined front together. The European Commission President saying that together, in record time, both the European Union and the United States managed to deploy sanctions in the last couple of days and ensure that they were enshrined into law. Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission President, saying that the ruble is already tumbling, inflation has, written, er, has risen in Russian and that banks are already cut off from the global markets. She said that the lines are open now between Brussels and Washington DC and that in the next couple of hours or days, they will not refrain from taking further restrictive measures against the regime of Vladimir Putin and that of Lukashenko in Belarus in order to stop what the EU Council President Charles Michel just a couple of days called geopolitical terrorism. And just this morning at the NATO headquarters here in Brussels, I had the chance to speak to Ned Price, which is the spokesperson for Antony. Blinken and he told me due to the concern and due to the threat of the nuclear attack as well that's why Anthony Blinken decided to fly into Brussels into Europe that Brussels is of course the first step of his European tour because of that concern and to show that the West is very much aligned and united and will not accept the behavior of Vladimir Putin and his regime. Well, Maeve, earlier we heard from NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg. Uh, he said the worst is yet to come. At the same time, he also ruled out the possibility of a, of a no-fly zone. So what could NATO's next steps be? Absolutely. Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, taking a very, what he called, pragmatic approach, telling the press this morning at the NATO headquarters that they didn't sign up for this war, that the NATO alliance was not in a conflict with Russia. He said this is Putin's war, that Putin is responsible for this war. He said that NATO allies have been speaking and trying to get the Russian delegation around the table. They, of course, back in January held a delegation with Russia. So he said this was not NATO's choice to have this. He said since 2014, the alliance has been helping the Ukrainian armed forces. They've been giving them weapons and training them. But of course, the big question that you're asking and everyone today was asking, and also Ukrainians outside the NATO headquarters, is what more can the NATO alliance do? And I spoke to one of those protesters, a lady called Anna, who organized that protest, and she's calling on NATO to one, introduce a no-fly or no-fly area, no-fly zone, excuse me, uh, over uh, the country, and also to equip her mother, who will start fighting, and her brother, and all the other Ukrainians with more weapons. You can take a listen now to Anna speaking to me this morning outside the NATO headquarters. 
We need fire jets. We need all possible air defense NATO has. It's very important that NATO acts now because it's not only Ukraine which Putin wants. He wants the whole Europe. He wants after you, if Ukraine falls, he will go further. He will definitely go to Baltics. He will go to Poland. This this war will reach NATO members, and it's important that NATO starts react immediately. Well, maybe we just heard that very stark warning there from that young woman. And as if a wake-up call was needed, we also woke up to the news this morning that a nuclear power plant had been set ablaze. So in light of that wake-up call in an already dire situation, do you think that this will escalate the response from the United States and from the European Union? Absolutely. And we, they are preparing. They are on high alert. I mean, the NATO alliance just a couple of years ago by Emmanuel Macron was called brain dead. But what we saw today and what we're seeing in the last couple of days is NATO and the European Union and all their Western allies, all the allies from the free world, all very much working together step by step in a careful, united approach. But what Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary, um, the Secretary General of NATO, also said today that he did not want to get dragged. He didn't want the NATO allies to get dragged into a war because, of course, if they would implement a no a no-fly zone. That's exactly, he fears, what would happen. So what he did talk about is beefing up countries like Georgia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, providing more weapons and more support to those countries. Because, of course, many argue that Vladimir Putin will not stop at Ukraine. He will target other countries like Georgia and, of course, Bosnia-Herzegovina, who are not NATO members. And that's why Anna and all the other protesters outside that NATO headquarters were calling for more support now, because otherwise, they argue, Vladimir Putin will not stop. All right, Maeve McMahon reporting there from Brussels. Maeve, good to talk to you as ever. Thank you. While there has been international condemnation of Russia's attack on Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant as its invading forces push forward and capture further territory. Now, the power plant is the biggest of its kind in Europe. It came under Russian rocket fire on Friday morning. A blaze broke out in the facility, but the head of the UN Atomic Agency confirmed that no radioactive material had been released. Now, the plant is now under Russian control, and Ukraine's President Zelensky called the attack terror on an unprecedented level. But Russia says the fire was staged by Ukrainian saboteurs. Well, there were reports of fierce fighting around the power plant during the night in the facility and the neighbouring town of Enogoda have since been surrounded uh, since the beginning of the week. Ukrainian officials say that up to three army personnel were killed and two wounded in the Russian attack. Well, the plant is situated in the uh, southeast of Ukraine and the facility is strategically uh, an important gain for Russian forces trying to take further control of the country. But elsewhere, the invading army are making slower progress. Kherson remains the only major city under Russian control. Heavy shelling continues in Kharkiv and the capital of Kyiv. The death toll from Thursday's Russian rocket attack in a residential district of Chernihiv has risen to 47. Well, the battle for Kyiv remains in the capital's suburbs and surrounding towns. Ukraine defence forces say that they are inflicting heavy damage on the Russian army. In the south, the city of Mariupol is under siege. The city's mayor says they have no water, heat or electricity and are running out of food. But Ukraine's President Zelensky remains defiant and says Ukraine will not be broken. Our defence is causing maximum losses to the enemy. There are almost 9,200 killed occupiers as of the morning of the ninth day of the war. We're hitting them near Mykolaiv, near Kharkiv and Kiev. The capital remains the key target for occupiers, but they won't break us. Well, the Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dmitry Kuleba, has sent a chilling message to those in Europe. We, together, for the sake of security in Europe, for the sake of prosperity of Europe. Russia tries to turn Ukraine into Syria, and the tactics they deploy are very similar to the one they excelled in Syria. But we should not allow them to create Syria in Europe. I am certain that this war develops in a way where the moment will come. You will be willing to provide us with anything, literally anything that we need, to stop Putin from hitting you and turning Europe into the nightmare. 
Russia and Ukraine have agreed in principle on the need for humanitarian corridors to help civilians escape Putin's eight-day invasion. More than 1.2 million people have already fled. 700,000 to Poland alone and the UN predicts 5 million Ukrainians will be displaced in the coming days. Now, the EU, the UK and the United States and other allied partners have approved plans to provide immediate assistance to those fleeing. Well, Monica Pina is on the other side of the Ukrainian-Polish border at one of the first stops for incoming refugees. We can cross over now to her. Good evening to you, Monica. Where are you and what have you seen? Good evening, Helen. I'm at one of the main arrival hubs close to the border in Poland. The blue building uh, behind me, not sure you can see it in the dark, but is an old supermarket that has been uh, turned into um, a reception center. It was before the Russian invasion, an empty building, and is now crammed with refugees. There are um, hundreds of refugees coming uh, all the time. I'm, I'm actually standing in a in a parking lot. It's pretty hectic uh, around me, and there are buses coming all the time uh, throughout the day, straight from the border. Um, refugees, as said, arrive here all the time. There are hundreds of them, and their stories are heartbreaking. They are often hard to hear. And I spoke with several of them. This is one one of them has to, to had to tell me. Near my city, it is an atomic station, electric station, and I'm I'm very scared about about my uh, home, and I hope that you, uh, Europe and all uh, world can help stop this this uh, Putin Putler or how we can call him. But I lost my home and I lost my normal life. I had dropped there, but now I need now I need to run away from my country. Monica, that is heartbreaking to see, and there are many other stories like that one as well. So, with that in mind, how is Poland now dealing with such a large influx of people? Yes, you said it. The latest uh, news from the Border Patrol say that. 700,000 refugees as have crossed into Poland. It's a huge number. And this country is the main uh, country of arrival. They are adapting fast to this situation. Uh, for example, this area just a few days ago was only a, a drop off point with uh, clothes and any kind of uh, good for uh, refugees. Now it is, um, there's also this reception center. There are hundreds of people that are, are going to spend the night here tonight and uh, others that are leaving to other countries or other location in Poland. The situation really is evolving fast. Authorities try to follow and also citizens. We have seen incredible examples of solidarities. Uh, there are um, cars and vans arriving here from, uh, I've seen from uh, Germany, from Italy, uh, from France, bringing food, bringing uh, clothes. And uh, it's uh, hard. The situation is heartbreaking, but also these examples of solidarities are incredible uh, to see and to witness. All right. Well, thank you for bringing them to us, Monica Pina in Pshamsho in Poland. Thank you. Fears of a nuclear disaster were raised after a fire broke out at the Zaporizhia power plant as it came under sustained attack by Russian forces. The International Atomic Agency, Energy Agency says all of the site's reactors are stable. No radiation was released. And joining me to discuss this is Robert Kelly, Distinguished Associate Fellow at Stockholm International Peace Research Institute and the former director of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And he is also a licensed nuclear engineer. Good to see you, sir. Thank Thank you for being with us. Um, without being alarmist, this is a massive plant. So how dangerous was this attack? I don't think the attack itself was dangerous. The way things worked out, they attacked somebody for some reason, uh, attacked a, um, a building on the external part of the plant. It wasn't the plant itself. I listened to the uh, young lady there before the break, and I think one of the things we need to do is put some... Um, perspective on what's going on there. There will not be another Chernobyl. Chernobyl was a very specific case. 
uh, something very unusual. And to, to try to equate what's going on there, I think, is very different. Chernobyl is if you had a, the pilot of a 747 just turned off all of the safety systems and plunged straight into the ground. That's not going to happen here. If I, I don't mean to make light of it. But the worst that could happen uh, at Zaporozhye is something like a Fukushima-type accident, which didn't have widespread consequences and would, did not pose that much of a threat to the local area. I think, I think a lot of people would look at Fukushima and say that that was a, a very worrying and disastrous situation that happened there. If something like Fukushima was to happen in Europe, that would cause a large scale of destruction. No. No, it, it would not cause a lot of destruction. It would cause local damage. It would cause problems to the water supply in that area. But it would not be a massive explosive release like Chernobyl was. I don't think that we want to make that kind of comparison. And let me quickly say that uh, when I say it would be similar to a Fukushima, uh, what we're saying is that's the worst possible case. Uh, something like a Fukushima, where there's a meltdown, but it's contained within the containment buildings. Um, that's just not on a par with Chernobyl. And I think it's been very irresponsible to say that something there would be like six Chernobyls. It's nothing like that. And it is under control, as far as we can see. Can you explain for uh, the lay members of the audience, myself included, uh, why you think that wouldn't be the risk, scientifically speaking? Just walk us through that. Because, of course, when we wake up to headlines about a nuclear power plant being on fire, people are concerned. So just explain to us scientifically how these plants are built and why it wouldn't be this kind of risk. This plant has a very large boiler inside of it that is fueled with nuclear fuel that produces a lot of heat and produces steam. And in that situation, when you turn it off, you turn it off. After it's been turned off, it remains very hot for days but it's nowhere near producing the kind of energy that it was when it was at full power. So you're in a situation there where if the cooling pumps continue to work, absolutely nothing will happen. It's not a problem at all. Then you can move into situations like, say, the Three Mile Island accident 40 years ago in the United States, where there was melting inside the reactor building, inside the core, and nothing got out whatsoever. So I think the, the worst that we could be looking at in this situation right now um, is something like Three Mile Island where nothing got out of the building. Yes, in Fukushima, it did get out of the building, but that was a really unprecedented accident where they had no emergency power whatsoever. So talk to us a bit about the strategy behind this, because we also know that Russian forces are now in charge. They have seized Chernobyl as well as with this uh, nuclear power plant. So what is the strategy uh, behind taking uh, power, taking control of these power plants? The strategy here is to put the entire country uh, into a cold shutdown position and cause the people there to be in the dark and be cold and be hungry. Uh, if you turn off all of the nuclear plants, and there are several others besides the one we're looking at, that's 50 percent electricity in the country. This is designed to hurt the population very badly. It's to create a siege from within the country. If they can't get electricity from any source, they're going to be cold and hungry and die. And I think that's a terrible humanitarian thing. You, you may have thought in my first comments there I was not worried about the humanitarian thing I am. I'm saying the technical part of it's not a problem. But the idea of starving these people to death and freezing them to death is horrible. I think what I was trying to understand is the fact that are Russian forces also trying to alarm our population? And that is the question, because when you see headlines like nuclear power plant in the hands of Russian forces, it does give rise to fears that people could be affected by radiation. And my question is, is that also part of the modus operandi? Well, I'd have to agree that that can be part of the modus operandi. The, the um, political propaganda value of this is, is very important. Of course, the people who are controlling the plant right now are the Russians, so they're going to be the first to suffer if they if they do some damage to the plant. But I think the real purpose of this is to is to freeze the people. This is this war is, has really been a very strange thing for something in Central Europe to attack the civilian population so much. And if there's no electricity in Kiev, there are an awful lot of things that aren't going to work well, and there are going to be a lot of people who are very uncomfortable, if not dead.
This is this right. is to hurt the people one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Robert Kelly, Distinguished Associate Fellow at Stockholm International Peace Research Institute and former director of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Thank you for being on the programme. In Russia, President Putin's invasion of Ukraine continues to be broadcast as a special military operation by state-controlled media in some of the country's last standing independent media has collapsed following pressure from the Kremlin and now a new legislation. Richard Cady reports. After a minute's silence for Russian soldiers killed in Ukraine, the Duma, the lower house of the Federal Assembly of Russia, approved a law punishing those who spread false information about the army with up to 15 years in prison. One of the forbidden terms is invasion. The official Russian line is special military operation. Alongside the offensive in Ukraine, there is also an offensive against elements of Russian media. Media outlets not conforming to the Kremlin's official line, such as the radio station Echoes of Moscow, have closed their doors. It was the most visible critical media still standing. We are now living in a quasi-state of war, and the government is introducing step-by-step -step restrictive laws that affect freedom of expression in general, not just journalists. But we have to admit that we have forgotten how we lived 30 years ago before Mikhail Gorbachev. In fact, we are going back to that time. Rain, a top independent TV station in Russia, announced on Thursday that it was suspending operations after receiving a threat of closure from the authorities. The station, one of the last remaining independent Russian media outlets, broadcast an emotional farewell as key staff members gave speeches. On Friday, Russian authorities restricted access to the websites of some foreign outlets, such as the local branch of the BBC, Deutsche Welle, Medusa, and Radio Sova Border. We leave you with a no comment from the Polish border with Ukraine, where camps are dealing with large numbers of refugees arriving every day. Thanks for watching Euronews tonight.